evening, everybody. My name is Joe DeLosa here at the South Bay branch of the Palm Beach County Library System. Uh, this is In Conversation, in fact, a special Writers Live edition of In Conversation. Uh, today, we are talking with Andy Campbell. He's a HuffPost senior reporter and editor who covers disinformation and extremism. He was one of the first journalists to cover the Proud Boys phenomenon, and his insights, reporting, and expertise formed the basis of his new book, We Are Proud Boys, How a Right-Wing Street Gang Ushered in a New Era of American Extremism. And I'm pleased to say that he joins us now. Andy, welcome to South Bay. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And again, thank you for having this conversation. It's such an important time for it. Of course. This is a particularly timely conversation we're having. This book um, is released at like a perfect time uh, because the, of the Proud Boys trial that's going on. Uh, five members of the Proud Boys are on trial for seditious conspiracy. And here in the library, library staffers and library uh, visitors are acutely aware of the Proud Boys because they're the ones or they're one of the groups that have been principally disrupting a lot of library programming related to LGBT uh, themed story time. So uh, mm -hmm. really happy to have you here, but maybe we should start at the beginning here. Uh, let's let's talk through who the Proud Boys are, who the key people are. So uh, maybe that's a good place to start. Who are the Proud Boys? Right. So the Proud Boys are a, a, a far right street gang uh, who have political violence in their rule set and who throughout their six year run um, uh, have been mobilizing on GOP's grievances. At once it was Trump's grievances. Now they are sort of, like you said, joining any sort of uh, right wing agitation, harassment, violence campaign they can against whatever Tucker Carlson or DeSantis or or Trump or anyone in GOP leadership is complaining about on any given day. Um, but they have through their uh, career of violence gone from what was started as sort of just a small time uh, fight gang to a full political force. And I can tell you a little bit about that, how that happened. So Proud Boys, when I first saw the Proud Boys as, as something concerning, I was covering for HuffPost increasing acts of violence at MAGA rallies across the country when Trump um, was just getting started. He was running his presidential campaign. Um, after he wins, these uh, violent rallies continue and they feature um, all sorts of weird figures from the internet. Uh, people draped in meme imagery, um, straight up neo-Nazis, but covered in, in, in sort of uh, uh, tongue-in-cheek um, garb so they don't look like Nazis. And I remember specifically uh, I was at a rally in Portland, Oregon in, in 2017, right after Trump won, and a kid was wearing uh, a flag as a cape. And the cape was uh, a, basically a German Nazi war flag, but instead of red, it was green, and instead of the swastika, it had the words Keck, which is a, 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 the, a reference to the Republic of Kekistan, which is like a 4chan meme, right? But we saw oh, so many of these weird groups, and we knew that this was going to be something that we needed to keep an eye on because all of a sudden these online groups started coming out into real life. The Proud Boys were a lot more concerning because they didn't hide behind anonymity. They wanted to talk to the press and they wanted to be lionized for their violence. A number of them have nicknames for acts of violence that they've committed um, and, and they wanted the world to know that they'd done this at the behest of the GOP. And so we latched on immediately uh, on the Proud Boys as something that was gonna be really concerning going forward uh, because any anytime somebody doesn't wanna hide uh, uh, violence that they're committing, that that that's something uh, of concern. Um, but, but the Proud Boys were built out of the audience of a reactionary talk show um, called the Gavin McGinnis Show. Some of your, your audience might know who Gavin McGinnis is. He is um, the co-founder of Vice Media, um, and he was a, you know, sort of shock jock type back in the early aughts, um, but he, he, his rhetoric was so gross, so, so violent, so misogynistic, so racist, um, that, that Vice Media in the early aughts pushed him out, um, and he started his, his online talk show, The Gavin McGinnis Show, and brought all of his 
audience of angry, young, mostly white men to his show where he doubled down on that rhetoric. And it's through that show, live on air, that he built this group, the Proud Boys. He he sort of pelted them with, with uh, uh, racist ideology, anti-immigrant, anti-LGBTQ, um, anti-Semitic, uh, and, and told them, you guys are going to get out there and do what crusty old Republicans can't do, and you're going to fight these grievances. All that anger, all of that you know, uh, angst that you have about these cultural issues, um, you're going to get out there and put a fist to that. Um, and that's exactly what they did. And so sure enough, since then, they've been involved in almost every big uh, act of political violence in America that you've seen since. Now, uh, you mentioned Gavin McInnes, uh, and I know mm -hmm. you spoke with him for this book. And uh, I want to uh, take a look at an excerpt from We Are Proud Boys, where you talk to him about what the politics of the Proud Boys are. Let's take a look mm -hmm. at this. Um, you write in the book, it, it led to some pretty glaring contradictions in their worldview when McInnes would try to come up in real time what the uh, agenda of the Proud Boys was on his show. Uh, McInnes wanted them to be racially inclusive. Oops, let me make sure I got that there. There we go. Racially inclusive, but harbor a sense of white supremacy. They were violently anti-immigration, but they welcomed international adherents. And their leader, of course, was an immigrant himself. McInnes didn't want them to be associated with Nazi skinheads, but he understood if members subscribed to a few anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Oops. Oh, wait, there we go. The Proud Boys doctrine was and still is difficult to pin down in one sentence or soundbite, and that proved to be beneficial down the road. For years, they were overlooked by the mainstream media and law enforcement agencies, which had no idea what to do with a group that wasn't voluntarily standing under a big sign that said Nazis or terrorists. The truth is that McInnes didn't care who joined the Proud Boys. Any man could become a member of this national coalition of patriots so long as they were willing to fight for the right-wing establishment's political ambitions. In fact, the only real politics held by the Proud Boys as a group involved supporting the Trump administration and opposing Democrats, McInnes told me. So is there a coherent ideology among all Proud Boys, or is this just an issue of are these just uh, a set of loosely associated uh, grievances uh, that all take the form of uh, some sort of right-wing xenophobia or right-wing hate? I guess, is there a coherent through line in the Proud Boys ideology? Right, that's a good question. I mean, the the, the ideology at its base is, as Gavin says, the West is the best. Uh, the, the sort of mantra for joining the Proud Boys that you have to repeat is, I am a Western chauvinist and I refuse to apologize for creating the modern world. And what Gavin did, and I think kind of smartly because it obfuscates um, you know, their, the hate at their core, is he said on his show to his audience, anyone can join the Proud Boys, black or white, uh, but you have to understand and accept that white men were responsible for the success of all Western culture. And so, there is this underlying sense of, of white supremacy. And sure enough, there are neo-Nazis that are involved in the Proud Boys, uh, but there are also people of color. And, and so what they are gathering under as, as a group is the idea that we can get out there and fight um, for, for the GOP's uh, grievances um, and we can get away with it um, if we stick together and if we make the right friends uh, within the GOP. So, you know, the, the through line is, is the West is best thing, but that is really only a conduit by which they commit um, these acts of violence. They truly see themselves as the extrajudicial enforcement arm of the GOP. They're doing what police won't do. They're bashing leftists. They're literally um, censoring uh, left-wing viewpoints by way of violence. And so that's that's what all of them gather under. And it really, the violence aspect creates very strange bedfellows. And so, you know, a lot of people ask me like, well, there's people of color. Um, clearly, uh, there's a person of color at, at one of their leadership positions, Enrique Tario, um, who is their chairman. He's now awaiting trial or in trial, I should say, on seditious conspiracy. Um, and, and a lot of people point to that and say, well, how can these guys be racist? And, and you know, that is the exact obfuscation that McGinnis had in mind when he had this kind of mantra that anyone can join. And sure enough, McGinnis, during that interview uh, that I had with him, brought up um, 
people of color in the Proud Boys, uh, uh, several Proud Boys who have black wives and children. So all the time, he sort of holds these aloft, even when out without asking about it, as as proof that hey, we're not bigoted. None of this is fueled by hate. But of course, we have the receipts. I mean, this is uh, this is at their core, absolutely. So who is joining the Proud Boys? I know there was a lot of internet discourse about um, like disaffected young men who feel lonely and isolated or don't have a sense of community. And um, to explain like a, why a lot of young men are drawn, for instance, to like the Manosphere and like a lot of Manosphere figures like Andrew Tate. Um, is this drawing from the same group or is this a different from a phenomenon? Like what are the demographics of the people who find themselves um, caught up in the Proud Boys? I, I think it's kind of changed. I think early on, they looked a lot like um, these sort of like young 4chan type, uh, you know, neo-Nazi or other extremist groups where you just had these like young guys online who who wanted to get out there on the promise to fight leftists. But in, uh, you know, as before January 6th happens, Trump gets on stage at uh, at the debate and, and says, you know, Proud Boys stand back, stand by when uh, he's asked to rebuff any of the extremists that gather under his banner. Um, and the Proud Boys immediately got so many recruiting calls. Um, Enrique Tario told me he'd gotten more recruiting calls than ever before after that moment. And, and that was in part because a lot of people believed that the Proud Boys were the ones who were going to get out there and fight back and 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 have the support of the GOP behind them. And so I think nowadays the people that are joining the Proud Boys there is a concerning uh number of people in this country who truly believe that the Proud Boys are out there fighting for G for GOP values and doing what what nobody else will for them. I mean, even after January 6th Ann Coulter, uh, a right-wing media pundit, longtime media pundit, um, wrote a blog called Thank God for the Proud Boys. And she uh, thanked the gang for, for doing security for her at one of her events. She said, these guys are fighting for us. Um, and so even after January 6th, even though a number of their leaders sit behind bars, you still have this swath of, of GOP support behind them. And, be, and, and because of that, um, many people who who seek to join up the Proud Boys are just regular people who believe if if I was you know it, if I want to fight leftism if I want to get out there and attack leftist ideology physically these are the guys that are going to give me the opportunity to do that and it's been very successful because before January sixth they really hadn't seen any legal consequences other than specific attacks that put a couple handful of people behind bars. Um, so it's very attractive to all sorts of uh, right wing folks. It's they've got military, they've got police in their ranks. Um, and and again, because there are no consequences often, um, you know, it's 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 easy to join up, <laughs> you know. Well, let's take a look at what joining up entails. Um, you cover this in your book about the various degrees involved uh, as when you go through the the Proud Boys, uh, I guess, hierarchy, the Proud Boys mm -hmm. system, like the Proud Boys master's program, I guess, or something like that. Um, there, are, there are four degrees, um, and your reporting was actually affirmed by some documents that were um, that, that came up in the Proud Boys sedition trial. We got right. a handbook from one of the defendants, uh, Dominique Pizzola, I believe is his name. Uh, yep. Some documents were uh, were seized from his home that was sort of a Proud Boys handbook. Um, and I think the defense was trying to suppress this from being shown to the jury. Um, so right. let's let's take a quick run through the the few different degrees involved uh, if somebody aspires to be a proud boy. And we can start with the first degree here, which is kind of a simple declaration that uh, they are a Western chauvinist who refuses to apologize for creating the modern world. Right. And and so so Gavin. Um, early on in his show, and, it, and I, I'm not sure if I said it, but the Proud Boys were started in 2016 uh, on Gavin McGinnis' show and, and then sort of started showing up in real life in early 2017 after Trump wins the presidency. But on his show, he's building out their worldview and their rules, their uniform, 
uh, all in real time, taking calls from people and literally going over this with his audience. And, and so the, the, he built the four degrees as um, their ranking system, how a proud boy ranks up. And again, like the first degree, all you have to do is in front of other proud boys and to the world, uh, repeat this mantra, but also um, you, you have to agree that you're always going to be a proud boy. If you're facing arrest, if your wife is leaving you, uh, if you're getting fired from your job, you will always be a proud boy and you will be proud of it. And so joining the proud boys is really, really easy. Um, but you, you accept a lot of baggage. So it's, it, it's harder to get out um, than it is to get in for sure. All right. Moving on to the second degree here. Uh, to be a second degree uh, proud boy involves a ritual called five cereals. Um, talk me through that one. So um, Gavin wanted to make this very ritualistic. He wanted, uh, but but also tongue in cheek, he wanted the Proud Boys to have this veneer of distance from uh, the violence that they commit. And so the second degree is twofold. And this is the first part of it. Uh, it's this ridiculous ritual in which uh, a new recruit is surrounded by his fellow Proud Boys and punched repeatedly until he can name five breakfast cereals. And there are YouTube videos of this. Um, and, the, you know, they sort of pound away as they name five breakfast cereals. Gavin McGinnis, who is obsessed um, with, you know, the idea of, you know, the feminization of men. He's obsessed with te testosterone. Very, very misogynist. Obviously, women can't join. Um, but this, this was sort of his way of saying, okay, you are ceremonially stealing yourself for battle. And, and getting your adrenaline up so you can fight better by getting pounded by your fellow Proud Boys. And so that's the first part of what the second degree requires. There is a, another part to it, which we will get to in a little bit later because I think it uh, fits well with another part of our discussion um, sure. that involves the Proud Boys um, bizarrely policing the masturbation habits of their potential recruits or for their members. Uh, yep. But the third degree, they need to have Proud Boy tattooed somewhere on their body. Mm -hmm. And you'll you'll see, um, uh, you know, this is either a regular tattoo or a cattle brand. I'm not sure I've seen any guys with cattle brands, but you'll see a lot of Proud Boys with the Proud Boy tattoo. It's just sort of old script font often across their arm. Um, and, and again, this is just showing, as with any sort of street gang, um, this is swearing more fealty, um, showing that there's, you know, it's harder and harder at this point to remove yourself um, from, from what you've signed up for. And that's just uh, classic gang behavior. And the fourth degree, the I guess the final degree in this series, um, it, I know, I, am, I think some people were surprised to find these in this handbook because it puts into writing uh, an aspect of the Proud Boys that uh, they perhaps don't want to have on paper, um, where they were a part of becoming a fourth degree is, quote, engaging in a major conflict for the cause. Right. And, and Gavin McGinnis actually revealed this in 2017 on Joe Rogan's show. Uh, Joe Rogan had him on where he sort of revealed the Proud Boys to the world and, and revealed the fourth degree. And this is where it gets more serious and because violence, political violence, is their driving factor. He said on Joe Rogan, they have to commit a significant act of violence for the cause. And that act of violence has to be confirmed. So it needs to be overseen by a number of other Proud Boys, or it needs to be recorded and published. Um, often they use acts of violence in their sizzle reels that they use for recruiting. Um, one very prominent uh, instance of a proud boy getting his fourth degree. Ethan Nordine, one of the five on trial for sedition, a uh, proud boy from Seattle, knocks out a uh, uh, anti-fascist demonstrator in Seattle, uh, and or sorry, in Portland, and uh, and there, there's video of this. He knocks the guy out cold. The guy has to be dragged away from by his allies. The proud boys are celebrating this. Alex Jones called it the punch heard around the world um, and sort of blasted this as something that was wonderful. Thank God, you know, for the Proud Boys. Um, and, and, and that earned Ethan Nordine his fourth degree. And because the fourth degree in writing gets them in trouble a lot, um, the, the, 
you know, the Proud Boys don't want when they go in front of the press or in front of a judge, they don't want in writing that they that they require political violence. Um, and they often deny that that even exists. Um, but I know from my reporting that rank and file Proud Boys to this day seek out the fourth degree. Um, it's it's what they are there for. They want to attack the left and sometimes they want to kill them. Um, so uh, to see that in writing uh, in a handbook that was brought up during the sedition trial, that, that surprised me. Um, Gavin McGinnis basically told me he was going to sue me if the fourth degree showed up in my book. Um, I, I'm, I'm not afraid of that lawsuit because uh, I have ex dozens and dozens of examples of Proud Boys seeking out the fourth degree and talking about it. Um, but but certainly that showed um, how uh, Gavin McGinnis wants to distance himself from that violence requirement. Um, but it's it's there and and they they certainly seek it out. I think a lot of Proud Boys probably earned their fourth degree on January 6th, given that there were dozens of them. Uh, there at the Capitol that day. And you mentioned in your book that a lot of the different chapters of the Proud Boys might have different initiation rituals or they might have different procedures. And I want to take this excerpt uh, from your book because I thought it was kind of horrifying. I mean, this isn't even necessarily... Um, this isn't even necessarily uh, the worst thing that the Proud Boys do, um, especially compared to the requirement of violence, but I think it kind of speaks to what being a proud boy is all about. You write, the initiation experience can vary depending on which chapter a recruit belongs to. The Wisconsin chapter, for example, reportedly subjects newbies to a hazing ritual in which they're forced to watch and interact with a torrent of violent and racist imagery online, including graphic videos of Muslims being killed and memes making light of rape victims or Jews killed in the Holocaust. Right. And, and you know, this just goes to show because I think um, people get confused when, you know, uh, when the media brings on someone like Gavin McGinnis, because what Gavin McGinnis tries to show the public, the, the Proud Boys image, he says these are patriots who are, uh, you know, are, are protesting. They're out there, you know, uh, celebrating uh, their, you know, uh, patriotism, and they are sometimes reluctantly pulled into violence by leftists who come to fight them. Um, this isn't true. And, it, you know, his uh, concept of they're just a drinking club is not true, but he's done a really good job of, of portraying them that way to the degree where, um, you know, government agencies thought that they were just a drinking club until January 6th happened. So it's been successful. But what's really happening under the hood is just what you showed on the screen there. I mean, if you go into a Proud Boys Telegram chat room today, um, you'll see maybe Gavin McGinnis. Uh, I think today he he said, let's watch the State of the Union together and make fun of Biden. And every single comment under there is swastikas, uh, anti-Black jokes, um, you know, just horrible, violent imagery, making light of rape. I mean, it is uh, a, a total cesspool in there. And, and I think that, you know, there's no way if, if you are ingrained in this to come out of, you know, any sort of Proud Boys um, meetup or event or chat room and say, these guys are just a patriotic drinking club. This is, this is clearly, clearly uh, much more far right extremism uh, than than just sort of a patriotic club. There were a couple of things in this handbook, and you kind of alluded to it earlier, um, that I wanted to show and ask you about. Um, one part of it deals with uh, how the Proud Boys got their name to begin with. Um, and actually, uh, Andy, if you could talk about that, why are they called the Proud Boys? Right. Well, the, this this is another um, uh, fact that flies in the face of, of Gavin's constant uh, uh, assertions that the Proud Boys aren't bigoted. But Gavin McInnes revealed on his show um, that he was um, at his children's music recital in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where he used to live. And uh, after his his young children got done with their uh, uh, their music talent, a, a young kid, maybe 12 years old with brown skin, got on stage uh, to sing a a musical number uh, from from the Aladdin musical titled "Proud of Your Boy." Um, now, Gavin on his show 
um, is singing this song. Uh, he hates it. He's calling, you know, he's saying, I hate musicals. This kid is gay. This kid has, is a fatherless Puerto Rican. I mean, he is just saying all these vile things about this child. Um, uh, but proud of your boy as he's singing it on and making fun of this kid sort of becomes the gang's calling card from there on out. Um, callers, you know, when they would call into his show would say proud of your boy instead of, you know, the age old uh, uh, first time caller, long time listener. Right. And so it becomes this inside joke. It becomes a calling card for them. And, you know, eventually when they decided on names, uh, proud of your boy, of course, gets shortened into proud boys. And that's the, the bigoted origins of this, just this sort of disgusting, um, talk about this child with brown skin, uh, that he saw play at his children's music recital. Yeah, and so in this handbook, apparently they consider the song from the Aladdin musical their anthem. According to this handbook, this chapter, they encourage their members to sing it at least once a night and try to find venues that have the song in the jukebox. And uh, we mentioned this earlier, and we don't I don't say this to be uh, salacious or lurid, um, but it is a part of the second degree um, or to become a second degree uh Proud Boy, uh, mm -hmm. they have what they call no wanks rule, which uh, I guess uh, their members are policed in terms of their masturbation habits uh, with uh, rules about how, how often they can do that and under what circumstances. And uh, I, wanted, I wanted to talk about that uh, because it relates to a question I have that I'll get to just after we do a quick reset because we are about a minute away from the top of the hour. So I just want okay. to take a moment to uh, reintroduce us here. My name is Joe DeLosa here at the South Bay branch of the Palm Beach County Library System. We're talking with Andy Campbell. He's a senior reporter and editor from HuffPost whose new book, We Are Proud Boys, How a Right-Wing Street Gang Ushered in a New Era of American Extremism is out in bookstores and at your local public library right now. And uh, Andy, thank you again for uh, being with us this evening. And thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, being here as well in the audience. Uh, you are welcome to uh, ask questions or uh, type comments in the chat. Uh, we'll try to get to any questions you might have uh, in the course of uh, the interview tonight. And a quick favor, if you do have the chat open, um, if you could type in the chat how many people are watching where you are. If it's just you, type in a number one. If it's you and a friend watching together, type in a two, and so on, just so we can have a sense of uh, our audience today. I know that uh, some folks are watching in groups, and I appreciate you doing that. And thank you for typing that in, everybody. And uh, Andy, I did uh, want to bring up the Proud Boys Anthem, uh, the uh, No Wanks Rule, um, because it made me, I, I, it, these things seem ridiculous. They make the Proud right. Boys seem like a ridiculous organization. And I know that in the past, when the way people have dealt with um, e extremists who seek to seem opposed or imposing or dangerous or violent has been through some degree of mockery of pointing out how um, dorky or uh, ridiculous they are. Um, and it makes me wonder if that strategy doesn't quite work with the Proud Boys. There was an article on NPR that I thought was really interesting that uh, I thought that I, I want to get your thoughts on this. Let me go ahead and pop it up and share it with you here. It talks about how the Proud Boys and other modern extremist groups seem to have weaponized irony in this new era. And uh, let me go ahead and just take a look at that here. Um, in uh, NPR, Tom Dreisbach writes, violent extremism in America long predates the internet, however, and so does a tactical use of irony. Historians have documented how the early iterations of the Ku Klux Klan were portrayed by group members and their allies as outlandish rather than as a dangerous terrorist group. The KKK put on racist minstrel shows and created its own songs. Uh, descriptions of attacks by men in hoods who had titles like dragon, ghoul, and wizard were often seen by white Americans as tall tales and ghost stories. Newspapers that supported the KKK played up those aspects of the group and mocked their opponents for supposedly taking the KKK too seriously, said a historian at Kent State University. And it makes me think, like, I know that the no wanks rule, the proud of your boy uh, origin story. All of these things are what a lot of people have been latching on to say how ridiculous the Proud Boys are. And it makes you wonder, is that parallel valid? It, have they been weaponizing 
or I guess I should say, have they intentionally incorporated ridiculous things like beating somebody up until they can name five cereals and having uh, various inane rules? Um, is that a part of their strategy to seem ridiculous so that people don't take them as seriously and then they can more perniciously and uh, seep their way into the American political system? Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's a good point because Gavin does that really well. Um, and, and, you know, what these sort of tongue in cheek, funny uh, rituals do um, for a group like this is they make them, like you said, sort of look unserious. But even with the, the no wanks rule, I mean, you know, and, and first of all, just to make it very clear, what, what it is, is, is Gavin McGinnis um, tells the Proud Boys that they cannot masturbate um, for but once a month, and they have to be within several feet of a woman if they're doing so. And so you can only imagine what kind of horrifying uh, incidents that that has led to in, in in public places. But but you know, you know, Gavin put that out there because he truly believes in an I this idea that you know foregoing masturbation foregoing sex is going to make you better at fighting and 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 the the fact that it's so ridiculous sort of numbs people to the fact that part of the rule uh in, involves violent misogyny i mean not you know only only you know committing a sex act if you're within a couple feet of a woman is a is a violent uh misogynist act and so all of these kinds of rules, these tongue in cheek things that that just casting the Proud Boys as this just drunken, rowdy, uh, uh, you know, patriotic club definitely deflects for them. Um, but it's also kind of true. I mean, you know, a lot of the the, the mo their most violent events have been preceded by dozens of them inside of a bar, often in D.C. or, you know, any liberal stronghold that they're they've sort of latched onto. Um, they'll do lines of Coke. They'll read from Pat Buchanan. They'll sing the Proud of Your Boy song. Um, and then, you know, in their sort of like rowdy, drunken, buffoon state, they will go out into the street and start just absolutely uh, attacking anyone um, that they see as their opponents. Um, and so, you know, it does a lot to obfuscate for the violence and and you know there is an element that they are totally ridiculous but you know you made the the sort of connection with the kkk they're not unlike the kkk at all um because despite their ridiculous nature um it, you know they have inroads with the gop they're running for office around the country they are pro police and they have police on their side um and of course they have violence in their rule set. And so that comparison is absolutely uh, uh, right, a right comparison. And also they are aided by, uh, you know, the internet. And, and, and so they are able to push out this ideology and recruit very easily with no money um, and, 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 you know, with a huge uh, uh, media network that they have access to. You mentioned the police. And I think one of the more concerning things is, uh, the apparent connection between some police officers and some police departments and Proud Boys. And you write this in the book, which is pretty alarming. You write, some officer Proud Boy relationships extend way beyond conflict of interest. On-duty cops have been revealed as active members on multiple occasions. But even then, their departments don't always know what to do with that information. Some have been fired outright for their affiliation, but other officers weren't found to have broken any rules at all. You go on to say that in 2019, a civil rights group investigating police ties with extremists revealed that an officer in East Hampton, Connecticut named Kevin P. Wilcox was not only a member of the Proud Boys, but also made dues payments to the gang. An inquiry into Wilcox lasted two months. In September, East Hampton Police Chief Dennis Wozner announced that Wilcox hadn't actually broken any policies. Wilcox, he said, adamantly denies being associated with white supremacist, supremacist groups, and that denial was apparently enough to exonerate him. Reached later by the Associated Press, Wozner said that there is no question that Wilcox is not is not a white supremacist. Asked what he knew, if anything, about the Proud Boys, the police chief admitted only what I searched on the internet. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, this connection between some police officers and the Proud Boys? Uh, it, it's, it's not always the case that um, police departments are themselves are members of the Proud Boys, although 
in that case in Connecticut, that was what was happening. Um, but there are also cases where perhaps police departments are chummy or familiar with the Proud Boys in a way that looks a bit untoward, especially for people living in towns who are protesting the presence of Proud Boys there. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I've covered so many of these rallies and, and uh, you know, especially in, in, in Portland, Oregon, which is, you know, seen as a liberal stronghold. Uh, but every time, uh, you know, every time you go down to one of these rallies, generally what you'll see, um, especially in Portland, um, is, you know, a line of Proud Boys on one side of the street, a line of counter protesters on the other side of the street, which could be Antifa or they could be locals. It's been both, uh, you know, uh, but but in the middle uh, between them will be a line of heavily armored police officers. Now, because one side, the Proud Boys side, is holding up back the blue banners, thin, thin blue line banners, they're pro-police, they're cheering on the police um, almost every time. And I say almost because I just, I, I, I can't say with certainty, but I've never seen it otherwise. Uh, the police have their backs to the Proud Boys who are outsiders coming in to commit violence and have been for years um, and have their munitions pointed at the counter protesters, which often consist of locals. And, and I think the pro-police messaging uh, has a lot to do with that. And it, it has been very attractive to individual officers across the country. I mean, even after January 6th, just uh, you know, a few weeks ago, um, a Chicago uh, police officer was uh, was found to have been affiliated with the Proud Boys, and he got suspended, but only because he lied about his affiliation. He's going to keep his job because, hey, it's not illegal to be a Proud Boy. Um, and, and they see it as a sort of First Amendment issue that he's sort of expressing his right um, to, to, you know, uh, to be in this group that's, uh, you know, out there in patriotic for the GOP. I would argue personally that this is a bias issue because when you have, um, you know, when you have an officer who is in a group that has political violence against the left and its rules and bigotry at, at its center, you're only going to get justice from that officer from a select group of people. And it sure is as heck isn't going to be, you know, anyone who's left wing or any person of color, any, you know, LGBTQ. I mean, there are a lot of people who stand to, to not see justice uh, from this officer, but departments don't know what to do. I mean, it, it's uh, some of them will kick you out immediately, um, but there's no national rubric for what to do when you find out there's an extremist in your ranks. And, and you know, that goes a little bit less for the military, but there are certainly members of the military who are part of the Proud Boys and other extremist groups too. Um, and again, I think it just has a lot to do um, with that pro-police messaging um, and, and with this idea that you get to um, you get to go out there and fight for politics. And, and, and that's attractive to military and it's attractive to police. One of the other concerning things about the relationship between police and Proud Boys is how uh, some police departments have reacted to Proud Boys disrupting uh, pride or LGBT themed events at public libraries. And that's candidly a part of the reason why this is of particular interest to me as a library worker and somebody who enjoys the public library. Um, I want to highlight two instances of Proud Boys disrupting a public library event that uh, was either drag related or LGBT themed um, LGBT themed uh, story time or something of that effect. Um, let's take a look at this one. This was in Wilmington, North Carolina, where uh, Proud Boys uh, disrupted a Pride event. I believe this was a story time featuring LGBT themed books. This wasn't a, uh, a drag story time, uh, but a LGBT themed story time. Um, Proud Boys caught wind of this event and then attempted to go inside the story time room where this was happening. Um, Police responded, but there was a lot of criticism from those attending the program uh, at the time because a lot of uh, attendees who gave contemporaneous accounts of what was happening on social media said that the police in Wilmington, North Carolina, seemed to be actually escorting the Proud Boy protesters to the story time room. Uh, the police department at, I believe this is... Um, I want to say New Hanover, uh, North Carolina, they denied it. They put out a statement saying that they 
at no time escorted the Proud Boys uh, to the story time room and that there was no conflict within the library. Um, people who were there at the time responded to it on social media, uh, pretty adamant saying that there, that the police's statement was not accurate. Um, there were some photographs taken that seemed to show that what the people who were, who were saying that the police were not being truthful about what was happening uh, seemed to support their account. Um, and there was one just recently, uh, earlier this year, uh, where a library in Queens um, was hosting an LGBT themed uh, program, a drag event. Um, a police wound up escorting uh, the the Proud Boys away from the library and to the subway. And what a lot of the uh, media in New York picked up on was that the Proud Boys did not need to pay the fare, which um, I don't live in right. New York, but I understand that this is a point of contention in New York because uh, fare evasion, it, like uh, the city has invested an inordinate amount of money on enforcing fare evasion. And this right. didn't sit right with a lot of people uh, because why are the Proud Boys getting a free ride? And actually we have a video uh, that um, somebody took of the Proud Boys getting on the subway and not having to pay. Let me see if I can uh, mm -hmm. share that real quick. Um, actually, let me make sure I can uh, share the audio while I'm at it. There we go. This is from uh, Twitter and TikTok user Brianna Lip, and let's take a look at this. Proud boys don't have to pay for the fare. No, Proud special. boys don't have to pay pay for the we're fare. We're special, thank you. You don't have to pay for the fare. I appreciate wow. it from your tax. Proud program. boys don't have to pay for the fare. Oh, thank you. That is insane. Proud boys don't have to pay for the fare. Three dollars. I just need you to go out. Oh, I have to pay for the fare, but they don't? Right. Is that the situation you're saying? That's correct. So, obviously that's troubling in the sense that it really, it, it doesn't invite community trust that right. for those who are opposed to the Proud Boys, that they can express their displeasure with the Proud Boys uh, with any level of safety. Does that seem and fair? Yeah, and, and and also, you know, the 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 NYPD puts a lot of resources into, um, uh, you know, getting people for fare evasion, uh, and and uh, often that affects marginalized communities um, and communities that the Proud Boys like to attack. On top of that, the Proud Boys have committed so many acts of violence that they, you know, in New York City, um, big, big uh, nation, national news stories um, of them attacking people um, at political events that, you know, the, you know, it's not as if these guys were unknown um, to the officers and they were there to harass and disrupt, um, like you said, a drag queen story hour. And, and so it, it, it absolutely um, builds distrust and, you know, it throughout um, the country, we've seen um, police departments sort of escorting them out despite this sort of laundry list of incidents. And so it's it, it's absolutely concerning. Um, and, you know, it's it's one of those things where, you know, people I, I think that police and local governments have a really hard time um, sort of you know, not giving them permits to do what they do. And, and because of the First Amendment issue, which in, in, you know, certain jurisdictions, they've decided, hey, this isn't a First Amendment issue. I'm not giving you a permit because the last five times you came here, you uh, attacked people and committed a bunch of felonies and destroyed property. I'm not going to give you the permit to do this. Um, and, you know, if you show up, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kick you out. And, and that's worked because it's, it's generally true. Um, but so many, so many jurisdictions just have no idea what to do with this. And it ends up with incidents like this, where it looks like that the police are protecting the Proud Boys rather than the community that they threaten. Now, why are the Proud Boys targeting LGBT themed programming? And, and these, uh, it's most prominent, um, with, uh, or I should say, this seemed to happen a lot over the summer, especially during right. Pride Month. Uh, it, If the Proud Boys were in the news for a good several months last year, it was almost always because they were tar targeting an, a Pride Story Hour, they were targeting a Drag Queen Story Hour. What is the particular obsession with uh, the LGBT community? Why are they such a uh, disproportionate recipient of Proud Boys abuse? 
Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I, and I think it speaks to what the actual threat is here and what the, our threat is going forward when it comes to extremism. Because you have hundreds of prosecutions and arrests. I think there's more than 950 arrests over January 6th right now. Hundreds of prosecutions. Um, and, and still, you have the extremist forces. Uh, many of the Proud Boys were arrested in that. You still have them out in the street. And, and so what they are, are, are doing right now is they are mobilizing, like I said, on grievances. They are turning the culture wars that you see on Twitter, that you see Ron DeSantis and Trump complaining about, um, and, and, and bringing that out violently into the street. So with the LGBTQ community, the grievance of the day uh, or of the year, really, last year, um, was that, you know, LGBTQ um, and specifically drag queens are are grooming our children somehow, despite being in communities and being wonderful for these communities for long, long, long time. Um, and 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 because Tucker Carlson and other media pundits and politicians have been just harping on this and moving the goalposts to make all LGBTQ events uh, appear threatening, inherently threatening somehow, um, you know, the Proud Boys and their allies, all kinds of other extremists, neo-Nazis, militiamen, um, those types of people have been mobilizing based on those grievances and going to drag queen story hours, trying to get them shut down, um, trying to create an image out of nowhere um, that these are harming our children. And it's it's just not true, but it's also what it's what they've done very successfully, I'd say, is helped to normalize this to where it's not weird for me to go to a civic event like uh, a, a public library for a drag queen story hour or a, a, a children's hospital where they have trans health care um, or a voting booth. And it's not weird now to see people in makeshift body armor, in Proud Boys gear, in AR-15s and, and fatigues um, at those events, putting a threatening air on this and sometimes fully attacking people. It's just not, um, it's not an odd sight. And that re it really shows, you know, that this specific incident against the, the the drag queen story hours it really just shows how far we've come in terms of normalizing this political extremism because um most of these extremist groups like the proud boys are are, are doing this at the behest of the gop and the gop has done little to nothing um, to rebuff them call them out of the street say stop attacking people more often than not they're celebrated as freedom fighters and that's that's the threat. That's the concern. Um, I think, you know, I, th I think I saw in the chat somebody asking what, how many are there, Proud Boys are there, how many, what is their actual threat? And, and my argument is, you know, there are thousands of Proud Boys. There have been, you know, it's gone down to hundreds. It's gone up. Um, you're probably not going to have to worry that a Proud Boy is going to knock on your door, although they have been made house calls to people that they don't like specifically. But it is their ability to coalition build on the right, because a lot of the right wing believes that these guys are the tip of the spear when it comes to their street level, you know, fight group. Um, and, and they are able to bring all kinds of allies, whether it be regular conservative voters or neo-Nazis or other factions on, on the extreme far right. They're, they're able to bring them together really quickly in a small space and say, we're going to intimidate this thing until it gets shut down. Um, or we're going to attack people if we have to. And they've done all of that um, with little or no slowing since January 6th. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's concerning to see um, going forward that, you know, I, this, this next election cycle and, and, and what we are looking at in terms of street level violence, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's scary. When you say normalization, um, to what degree does that normalization occur because of the media? I know that uh, right wing media or more conservative media. Um, well, you mentioned in your book, actually, there was one uh, particular uh, incident of interest that uh, that caught my eye. You mentioned that Fox News covering a 2018 Proud Boys attack in New York. Um, 
they they covered it as if it Antifa were the instigators. And you mentioned that um, there, there was a graphic that said Antifa attacks again, swords and vandalism at New York GOP office. Um, with that Chiron up there insinuating that Antifa has swords when in their own B-roll, it shows Gavin McGinnis with the right. sword. That's um, Gavin McGinnis with a sword. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, you know, but, but this is, this is how um, the media plays into it on the right and, and supports um, the extremist factions by deflecting and, and, and pointing the other way and making the threat look bigger. Um, you know, that, that act that you put on the screen right there, um, five proud boys attacked um, uh, counter protesters that showed up to a GOP event where Gavin McGinnis was speaking, um, attacked them so ruthlessly that several of them remain in jail today. That was in 2018. Um, and, you know, the, the attack was totally gruesome. Um, and, and Fox News said it was the left that did it. Uh, Fox News said, uh, and, and Tucker Carlson specifically, maintain that Antifa had something to do with January 6th and may have put it all together as some sort of false flag operation. Um, uh, you know, Trump uh, said there were very fine people on both sides after the Unite the Right rally, uh, neo-Nazi rally in 2017. This deflection tactic um, has gone, you know, has worked really well to sort of elevate the threat on the left um, to the same level as the threat that we're seeing from far right extremism. Um, and the media works really hard um, to make sure that the public sees it that way. It, you, you will undoubtedly um, think of the 2020 um, uh, BLM protests across the country. And many, if you, if you watched Fox News or really if you watched any mainstream media, some people believe uh, because of what they saw that cities are still on fire today uh, because of the the uh, protests there and the violence that broke out. And in reality, uh, a researcher uh, looked at every single of several thousand events that summer of 2020 and found that at 99.9% of, of these events, there were no, uh, I think there were, there were no calls to police for acts of violence and no calls for property destruction. So these were highly peaceful events that the right has blown up into this, the leftist threat um, that we face. And so this is what the media, you know, does to show um, that it's not the Proud Boys we need to worry about. It is, it is the left. And it does a lot to make the Proud Boys look like a legitimate force. It makes a lot of the public believe, hey, we need these guys out there because of this fabricated story about the left. And I know I work at HuffPost. We are a left-leaning organization, um, and, and you know people like to ask me a lot, like, well, what you know, what is your your bias in in terms of your coverage there? And you know, my answer is, look, we cover uh, when leftist acts of violence happen. We cover leftist groups that get out of hand. Um, and but the 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 numbers, the the far right terror that we're seeing is just such a monstrous threat in comparison um that that's what we're covering and 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 uh you know to to try and and put the two on the same level um it's just it's just false it's just the numbers do not add up um and and certainly the uh big acts of extremism do not add up that actually addresses one of the questions we had in the chat uh who poses a greater threat to our democracy the proud boys or antifa um yeah, you know, like I said, I mean, you, you look at those events and and the 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 numbers of attacks, the uh, amount of coalition building just don't add up. I mean, the, the there have been several acts of violence um, uh, at the hands of anti-fascist demonstrators. There have been a number of instances where anti-fascist demonstrators have. Uh, firebombed uh, empty law enforcement buildings across the country. Um, and there have been BLM rallies where windows were broken and there you know, was petty crime and theft that happened there. Um, but the, I mean, the far right terror that we have right now is such that you have um, 
mass shootings across the country in Trump's name. You have um, uh, people trying to attack FBI field offices because Trump, uh, you know, was criticizing them for um, Mar-a-Lago, for raiding Mar-a-Lago. You have people sending bombs to Democratic leaders that Trump, uh, uh, you know, said he didn't like. You have, uh, and that's on top of all of these big extremist events like January 6th, like uh, Unite the Right, um, and, and like all of these Proud Boys attacks. And so the threat, um, you know, researchers say that we're seeing a threat that we haven't seen in 40 years uh, in terms of extremist terror uh, happening in America. And it's just, um, it's just impossible if you tried to, to show Antifa as an equal threat. It's not even close. In our last few minutes here, uh, I want to read this excerpt uh, from your book. Uh, you write that experts and activists agree that the Proud Boys' greatest impact was not in their ability to make big violent events happen, though they certainly did plenty of that, but in their successful normalization of political violence and bigoted rhetoric pulled from the fringes of the far right and into the mainstream. You go on to say that uh, they are the reason you can expect now at any American protest, not just cardboard signs and sit-ins, but men covered in football pads and makeshift armor, wielding the stars and stripes as weapons and beating any protester who dares try to confront them. Is this going to get better? Like, is this just a weird political moment where um, we have a particularly uh, pugnacious uh, political mood and we will get back to normal? Or is is this or is this a new normal that we have to adjust to that participating in American political life means stealing yourself against the possibility of political violence? Well, you know, it's a great question. I wish I had the answer for it, but I'll tell you, the communities that I've spoken to that that you know that have been under siege by extremist groups, not just the Proud Boys, you know, they they're looking for an entire culture shift. This is a group that has embedded itself in the highest levels of right-wing government. They've run for office. They have friends up to Donald Trump's inner circle. Enrique Tarrio uh, from from Florida. Um, is friends with Roger Stone. And both of them talked to me about that. So they have embedded themselves in, in right-wing politics. They have uh, uh, friendships and, and relationships in law enforcement. And of course, they have that huge um, right-wing media s- sphere that is helping support them. And so to, to really, really quash this problem, you have to have a full culture shift where all three of those elements, the media, the law enforcement, and politics step back and say, we need to audit ourselves. We need to, you know, go out and say, uh, this isn't us. And and we need to rebuff them because so far that's just not happening on a national scale. And especially um, when it comes to politicians and right-wing media, um, there is just no, uh, there's no pushback right now. And, and, and so you're seeing violence in the street and you're seeing the GOP uh, be silent about it. And uh, it, there is, you know, they are rallying or circling the wagons around these guys. And, and that's, that's where um, it needs to start if, if we're going to see any, anything change into the next election. Andy, I know that we're coming up at the end of our time. Do you have time for a couple of the questions in the chat or do you got to run? Certainly. Okay, excellent. It looks like Anand is asking, what is the typical age of new recruits of the Proud Boys? Have you talked to people who left after being disillusioned? You know, it's a great question because I think it it, it speaks to um, the issue with de-radicalization and extremism right now. I think think the average age is in in their 30s and early 40s. You know, um, guys who uh, you know, you're, it, it looks a lot like um, what you saw at January 6. You know, these are these are people that are sort of at their wits end. Um, they're they're sort of angsty and they might have a little bit of combat experience. They might have a little bit of middle, military experience or they just wish that they could have kept uh, fighting and not getting in trouble uh, for it in high school. And so it's 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 definitely skews. Uh, in in sort of the mid 30s area, um, but but you know um, the 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 fact of the de-radicalization aspect, it's really hard because they're such a new group. Because for me, you know, there there are certainly proud boys out there who say I quit, I'm not, I'm not a part of that anymore, and and they often do this in the face of 
charges or, you know, January 6th and they say, I, I'm out. For, for me, it's not enough when you are a part of an extremist group um, with, with some violent ideology um, and, and bigoted ideology to say you're out. Um, you have to also, you know, it, take, it can take years for somebody to not only show that they're not involved anymore, because oftentimes they're lying, or, and, you know, I think that they need to be doing work to help others de-radicalize and, and pull them out of those movements. And, and the Proud Boys are just too young to sort of definitively say, okay, this guy, you know, got charged with assault. He says he's out. Um, it's it's too early to tell whether he is truly uh, uh, de-radicalized or not, um, because so often we see that that's not the case and they're still chatting or hanging out or fighting together. We have another question in the chat. Are the Do the Proud Boys claim to be Christians or religious? There are. I mean, certainly um, they, they sort of religion is uh, one of the pillars that extremists use um, to sort of show because, you know, religion, especially Christian religion, um, is, you know, a patriotic pillar in this country. And so they they absolutely um, use God and country as the, as as their pillars. Um, a lot of them are Christian. They are absolutely anti-Muslim um, and, and certainly anti-Semitic. And so you're not going to see uh, any Muslims or not many Jews uh, in, in in the Proud Boys, if if there are, um, they're often held aloft again, uh, just like with people of color, as evidence that the Proud Boys could not be bigoted in any way. Um, but certainly, Christian religion is used as a, a sort of support device, and and a lot of the guys are are Christian. I wouldn't call them uh, explicitly. Um, Christian nationalists or Chris, Christo fascists, I, 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 but certainly um, that that imagery um, and rhetoric is used. Andy Campbell, senior editor and reporter at HuffPost, author of We Are Proud Boys, How a Right-Wing Street Gang Ushered in a New Era of American Extremism. Andy, thank you so much for making the time tonight and for being so generous with your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, the book is wonderful, and I'm so glad that uh, you're able to talk with us about it. Hey, thanks to you and your audience. They have great questions and, and you did so much research for this. I, I, I love uh, having a discussion like this and I, I really appreciate it because I think this is such an important issue. So thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much, Andy. If you want to pick up Andy's book, oops. You can do so at many different retailers. Uh, if you want to support your local independent bookseller, you can buy it from our friends at Book and Books at the link on the screen. If you'd like to support your local independent billionaire oligarch, it's also on Amazon. Uh, before we go, uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, please let us know what you thought of tonight's interview, especially if you'd like to see more interviews like this. You can visit our website to take a survey, pbclibrary.org slash survey. And if you'd like to financially support PBC Library activities, uh, we hope you might consider donating to or joining the Friends of the Palm Beach County Library. You can find more information about that at pbclibrary.org slash friends. I do want to thank my colleagues, Aaron in marketing, Christina in community engagement, and my branch manager, Graham, for all their help putting this together. And I'd like to thank our audience members watching tonight. I know there are plenty of ways you could spend your evening. The fact that you've chosen to spend it with the library means the world to us, and we are very sincerely grateful for that. And Andy, again, thank you so much for making the time and for being so generous with your insights. Uh, it's really a remarkable book. I should say that we just scratched the surface here. There is way more uh, about the Proud Boys to learn about, and I highly, highly recommend picking up a copy if you can. Um, Andy, audience, everybody, thank you so much for taking part in today's conversation. Uh, you, if you'd like to take part in more Writers Live events, you can visit PBC Library. Dot org. Click learn more under Writers Live. And if you'd like to see me host another Writers Live thing and you're local, I'm actually doing another one of these. March 9th, we'll be talking with Chris Stedman, author of IRL at the Gardens Branch Library. So please stop by if you're in the Palm Beach Gardens area. I promise I am less sweaty in person. This is just a very hot room. Uh, thank you again, everybody. Um, this was really wonderful. And Andy, thank you so much again. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Have a good night.